Okay. Today, we are going to be talking with Sarah Bradley. She is someone who has journeyed um, with different eating disorders, and she's really experienced a lot from different therapists, and um, she's had experiences in psychiatry, and she is, um, according to her, 9 out of 10, 10 being the highest of recovery, she's 9 out of 10 out of her eating disorder in her journey, and so it's a pleasure to have her on today. Um, we're going to talk about um, why people with eating disorders think about food all the time. We're going to talk about how it's not just about body image and it's not just about um, what you look like. And that's not the only thing that's driving eating disorders, but there seems to be um, other things as well. We're going to talk about um, different studies. We're going to talk about her experience, her journey, and um, going back from, to her childhood her adolescence, and then um, um, collegial time period, and and all of the different aspects that she has been able to sort of learn and grow in this journey. So here we go. First of all, like, where did it begin for you? Um, I would probably say around age seven or eight. I can just remember being really weird about food. Just really overthinking it and just feeling like I shouldn't eat and having this really intense obsession with exercise at a very early age. Um, I was never focused on my body. I was just felt this overwhelming urge to zone in on my diet and my exercise. Hmm. Okay. And um, was there are any contributing factors from your parents that you can tell? Like, did they talk about food a lot? No, they, they never. Did they talk about exercise a lot? No, they never ever did. They never put pressure on. I mean, I was never overweight or underweight. I was always totally run of the mill, normal. Um, my sister as well. Uh, my parents never said like, no, you can't eat that. Like that was never a thing. I, I don't, I mean, I, I wore the, I wore uniform to school, the same uniform as all my peers going to parochial school. Um, so I really don't, f I never looking back on it, and it's hard. I mean, it's like, what, 18 years, mm -hmm. 18 years past. But reflecting on it, I don't really feel like there were any, you know, social pressures. Okay. And you had mentioned earlier that you had some, like, obsessiveness start as oh well my gosh. at that age. Yeah. Yeah, I had to do, so it was kind of like tied in with the exercise. So I had to do 50 sit-ups uh, right after I ate anything, no matter where I was. And I had to do four sets of 25 sit-ups facing a certain wall as a kid as well. And I had this thing about the number eight. And I, I think by maybe age 10 or 11, I would only let myself eat between the hours of, I think it was um, 11 a.m. and like 8 p.m. And I would not eat outside. The, like just very obsessional aspects, um, still around numbers, but like tied in hmm. with okay. eating. Yeah. If that makes and, sense. And when did you first... Um when did any family members or anyone notice at first? Probably around age 10. Okay. Um, so my mom actually has her master's in psychology, and she was a social worker for her, her career. And my dad actually worked in nutrition um, at a mental state hospital. So, oh. but, and they, they noticed some things. They, they definitely did, and they would bring them to my attention. But I think there was so much other conflict going in uh going on in the household um and I was also really good at hiding it um I think that's something kind of notorious with people with eating disorders um it was actually my teachers at school and my friend's parents that were making a lot of comments and sharing a lot of concern both with directly to me and bringing it up to my parents and I think um, after enough other adults kind of said something to my mom, she 
kind mm-hmm. of realized it was a bigger issue. Um, okay. But yeah, I definitely got a lot of comments from teachers at school. And it, I had this teacher who would come up to me at lunch and just say, like, you have to eat more. You're... <laughs> she said you've lost way too much weight, but she said it in front of all the other kids at school. And it was so humiliated. She, the next day, came into hmm. school and she had these, like, she wrote out these, like, healthy smoothie recipes oh. for me and was like, you should try these. And she would, like, look at my lunch tray every day at school. And it was just a very odd approach. <laughs> I was really confused that she was, especially now as an adult, looking back on it, that she, would, that she was bringing it up to me. But yeah, yeah I d- from it teachers. Oh it yeah, really I mean, it was like eleven, like ten, ten, eleven, mm-hmm. like fifth, fifth, sixth grade. Yeah, I really and my peers. Actually, the first time I ever heard the word anorexia, was one of my uh, friends at school, said, "Well, Sarah's anorexic," and I literally was like, "What's that?" Like I didn't even know what I was doing. Like hmm. I had no perception. I was like, "What? What do you mean?" And she's like, "Well, you're really skinny and you don't eat." And I was like, oh, that's a thing. And I I had, I mean, that was my first, you know. Okay. And did you think about food a lot? At the time, I was thinking about how to not eat a lot. Like how to, I was more obsessed with food, rather than food itself, I was more obsessed with how do I keep the um, craving, the obsession of wanting to eat away Mm -hmm. and I would I remember going to bed at night and just feeling if I woke up because I would go to bed hungry a lot and if I woke up and I made it through the night without eating something and I woke up feeling like really you know hungry and exhausted I felt like euphoric over that like just absolutely like I won the battle like, I really enjoyed that feeling if I could not eat after, you know, early in the evening and then just make it until, like, lunch the next day. I just you, loved that feeling. You felt, like, victorious? Oh, yeah. I, to- I totally did. Yeah. And so, um, so most of what you were doing mm-hmm. was, like, you felt good about it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, were there any other positive reinforcers that kept you wanting to do it more? Is there any other positive, like? I really don't think so. I wasn't, I think sometimes if, especially a child is overweight to begin with and they like get a lot of compliments um, about their body or they look good or um, especially like with teenagers, that can be definitely like a positive reinforcer. But I wasn't overweight and I was like so young. Um, I think I enjoyed at the time, I think I, looking back on it, I'm assuming that I probably enjoyed the concern from other people because the way I look back at it now is I probably felt like very um, underappreciated and kind of just cast aside from my entire family. So I probably, if I had to guess what was feeding it is I enjoyed that concern from Mm. other people because did you get connection through that i'm sorry if that's a frustrating oh no 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 no. i'm just trying to think um like people's concern it's kind of like a form of connection right yeah i don't it's such an isolating illness i don't think so but i think i just really enjoyed like oh people actually care about me but i didn't really you know latch on to it because i wanted to keep it going yeah does that make sense yeah. Kind of a messed up cycle. Did, did it bring you into relationship with people in a deeper way? No. 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 Okay. No. I remember actually, I think I was like 12 or 13 at this point, And one of my dance teachers, she, she like, after class one day, she's like, you just seem so sad all the time. And I'm just like, okay. And she like tried to give me a hug and I like didn't really, you know, I wasn't uh, very, it wasn't reciprocating the same emotion back to her. And she was like, see, like a few years ago, you would have given me this really big, tight hug. And you just, you're, she's like, you're just a different person. And I, 
I was like, well, I don't know what to do. You know, I mean, I was so young. I don't, I don't really blame myself for. Yeah, it's of, of course. But you don't no, blame I don't. Yourself. It felt very isolated. Yeah. Okay. And when you were in the midst of it, um, did you just not feel very much? Did I just emotion or connection, or you felt. I felt very alone, um, but I really enjoyed kind of that euphoric feeling of not eating. I just really enjoyed that empty, like hungry, dizzy feeling. I just, I loved it. Um, mm. I haven't experienced that in a, such a long time. Uh, really, yeah. that was only specific to my early teenage, you know, yeah. years. But um, I remember really enjoying that feeling. Okay. And did you uh, do any other types of behaviors that were um, like restricting? You, so you restricted some food, you did some exercise. Were there any other types of behaviors as well? No, it was pretty, yeah. I mean, like I, I think I told you before, like I had like certain calculations, like how many times I had to brush my teeth and that would go overboard, um, like washing my hands, that kind of thing. But mm. no, not really nothing else. Did you have thoughts, I wish I was dead, I wish I wasn't alive when you were an adolescent, 12, 13, no, 14? No, no, I never felt that when I was that young, no. Okay. Um, but later on, you oh, felt yeah. that way? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, later on. When, and um, throwing up after we, when did that start? How old were you? So, this is, so, to me, it's still crazy, very probably rare that I was able to kind of come out of it. I actually had a very normal time between probably ages 14 and 18 going on 19. I actually, so my parents got a divorce and that kind of lifted a lot of the stress that I was feeling in my household. And after they divorced, like within the next year, I was totally different. I weighed a lot more. I finally like hit puberty. Um, I was like not really matching my peers anymore um until that point and i just got over it and i stopped all my weird behaviors hmm. it just completely snapped out of it it was i really think that's probably not the case with most people um but for some reason just the change of environment was enough for me and actually i had a really good time in high school i ate whatever i wanted i you know it was very normal i would you know go to parties and eat pizza with all my friends. I, um, I had a very normal teenage girl body, like not super fit, not thin, just very normal, you know? Okay. Um, and then I went to college and it kind of reared its head again. Hmm. Um, this time a little bit different though. And the throwing up started, I think at the very end of my freshman year, of college I think it was like going into my sophomore year like that summer so it was 19 okay so it, it didn't start when you were younger it started the vomiting no I never even college. tried okay. when I was younger no and um yeah what was and how long did it go on how many times per day oh god how many <laughs> days per week so it kind of was a off and on thing for a couple of years let's see I did it pretty intensely like at least once a day Mm -hmm. for the first few months and I got really thin I dropped so here's the thing uh if I were talking to a different audience so I'm talking to you and this podcast is kind of more catered towards clinicians yeah if I were in a different setting with other people like my peers or other people with eating disorders I would not use numbers because that can be really triggering for those kind of like it can be really triggering knowing like someone else's weight um how many calories eat because you get in this game of comparison so um but for the sake of this podcast i'll use numbers so we can get a better like ballpark idea so i was like about what i weigh now which is like mid 120s and i got down to like about 105 um over like two months and i was probably vomiting at least once a day and the only thing i kept down was like a ton of raw vegetables i did that for like an entire summer wow and uh, I got back to school, and um, the the dean, the student, the dean of students, I think okay. it's called, 
uh, actually had me come into her office and she, you know, very nicely, but very clearly, you know, like, she, I remember her exact words, like, if we're looking at another 10 pounds, I just don't think you can be here. Like, mm. at, you know, and not like, you know, you have to leave campus forever and never come back to school. But like, I knew she was insinuating, like, it's like not safe and it's like a liability and I probably needed some type of more serious help than what my university like outpatient services had to offer. Okay. So that was kind of um, a wake up call for me. And I really wanted to do well with running. And that was actually the first year I qualified for the NCAA championships. And I really wanted to excel like in school and in my sport. So I was able to like stop the purging for like a few months. Um, and then I had a lot of really awful stuff happen in my personal life. And I kind of started purging again. And this cycle went on for probably like three years. And at its worst, I would say I was purging five days a week, twice a day. So pretty okay. intensely. And did you, did you have... Um... And so when did you start like seeing therapists or seeing like professionals? When I was 19, when whenever 19. like the Dean of Students was like, you really have to get this together. Like, okay. you know, we don't really, um, what, what were some of those early encounters like? Were they helpful? Were they not helpful? Um, I think that the clinicians at, at my, um, alma mater's health services, um, are, have, have been wonderful people. And I think that they really cared. And I think that they always meant well. Um, but they, I just don't think they had any experience and they admitted that they really didn't know. Not that they had like never encountered this before, but like they only have so much knowledge and skill with this. What do you think they would, what do you wish they would have done more of? Um, well, it's kind of like I went to go see the like uh, the nurse practitioner once and she just you know gave me this lecture about um like how bad this was and I was like yeah and then I never went back to see her like they never had me come back I went to therapy and uh the first therapist I saw um what I'm about to say I feel like it doesn't even sound real but she said that I was the most difficult person she's ever worked with in her entire career. And I, I mean, I honestly don't even, it sounds like I'm making this up, but she said uh, she doesn't know how I have any friends, any family. And a peer of mine had went to go see her as well and had a similar experience. Yeah, but right. she, I really think she meant well. And anytime I've seen her since, I like give her a hug. I mean, she really, I think, means well. I just don't think she deals with type A females well because I had a friend who had a similar experience she didn't have an eating disorder but um, I went to another guy and like honestly he was a cool guy uh, he was like the director of the program but I we never talked about my eating disorder he had no idea what to say so there's some frustration there too I mean <laughs> he had no what, idea what, just... what would have been things that you would have appreciated or the the, ther the good therapists that you've had in the future, like what have they done? How have they brought it up that's been helpful? Um, I think realizing that it's really not so much about the food or the eating. I think it can be to an extent, but um, probably trying to pinpoint like, you know, why do I, you know, resort to this when I'm really stressed out kind of a thing. Um, and they really try to ask, like, what's actually going on, like, in your head? Like, what are you, you know, actually thinking? Um, and some of the clinicians, like, the first few clinicians I would see, they would just kind of, like, kind of brush off what I was thinking, like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, you're, you're, I mean, the thi I, to Western society, and I hope I don't mean to sound egotistical, I am an attractive girl. Um, and they're like, you have such a nice body, and why, you know, that's silly. Like, I'm like, that just made me feel stupid, because it's, it's just not about that. So, so I, when I hear that, I hear a huge lack of empathy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And into your experience, like, they couldn't, like, insert themselves into your experience. Yeah. 
what what are some other ways that they people have had a harder time inserting themselves into someone like yourself's experience or into someone with eating disorder you know i think this is a good sort of uh, this, this is kind of what we've been talking about the, the weeks way. leading up to this, right? Yeah. But I, th- I think for, for you know, the, the therapists or clinicians or people in training who are listening to this, um, hearing someone's story is important because it's mm-hmm. like they might not have heard someone's story and heard someone's story at different places in their mm-hmm. journey, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and so I think it's really good to have someone who has, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like gone through the system have okay. different experiences yeah. and share those. But I'm just curious, in, um, coming examples? back to this theme of like empathy, maybe just let's stick with you for now. What are okay. some other examples of places where you didn't feel heard or understood? Okay. And um, in you, in the in this sort of phase? Yeah, I remember there was a dietitian I saw once and it, like she had me do like a 24-hour recall. Like what did you eat? past 24 hours and I had eaten like a pop tart and she was like well there are much better choices than a pop tart and I was just thinking and this is when I was like you know 20 25 pounds thinner than I am now and she and she was speaking from a point of nutrient density but I just remember thinking like how awful is that to say to someone who's like afraid to eat like I just remember thinking like that's ridiculous like I ate a pop tart you know what I mean but she didn't get that and she also said And I didn't even bring up my feelings at all. But she walked into the room and said the first thing she said was she was trying to explain the structure of the, you know, relationship between she and I and like what her office, what her space was going to offer me, which is that's that's fine, you know. But the first thing she said was, this is not a place where we talk about your feelings. This is not therapy. I'm just here to talk to you about food. And like, okay, to an extent, I can get that because I actually study nutrition. But as someone who's like working with an eating disordered patient, that's like so rude and harsh. And how could how could the two not be related for me? How could you think that I'm not intertwining some emotion in this? Of, of course you're intertwining emotion. I mean... And, I never Food, saw her again. <laughs> yeah, and of course you're entitled to your frustration and your boundary of not seeing her again, you know? Yeah, um, and I'm trying to think of, um, so yeah, other than the like, oh, you have a perfect body, why would you, you know, that's so silly that you, you know, care about your weight. Um, I would say another thing would be just not... <sighs> And that's interesting because that's not really how it even started. No. You know, when you were seven or eight or, you know. Well, no no one knew this in college. I never got help for it as a child, which blows my mind that my parents didn't um, intervene. But, um, you know, I kind of just got over it magically as a kid, right? Um, So my first experience, like, they had no insight. They never asked me about my history. And the other thing is they just, some clinicians have... Uh, honestly, I feel like you kind of almost have to think about it in a context maybe similar, like speaking to someone with schizophrenia, like there are things that they're going to think and worry about. And you may not know what they are, but like you should know that like this is a very secretive disorder and we just don't, people that I know and myself don't, we don't really want to share it, but like it's there like for instance like the um i think like anxiety about medications like it took me years to go on them and be compliant and i never you know actually felt like they were being a bad clinician because of that but like there are just so many things that goes on in the in in my head that have have gone on and it's like how could you think that it's just as basic as like i just don't want to eat this or i'm gonna throw it up okay so give me um Give me some examples of common things that went on in your mind and maybe common things that go on in other people's minds with eating disorders that um, that are different or you wouldn't know unless you maybe have struggled with it or worked with people with it. Yeah, yeah. And like, I guess to try to like kind of phrase what I'm saying is like, if you know someone with has schizophrenia, you're going to know that they probably have some type of delusion going on or hallucination going on. And you may not know what it is, but, like, if you know that it's there, like, I feel like it's a part of the clinician's job to help 
sort it out. What the, I, what the medical students are surprised at is when they're watching you interview someone and within like a very short amount of time, the patient's telling the psychiatrist things that they didn't tell the medical student after like an hour. Yeah. And so it's like there's certain things that we know are just pattern recognition. Yeah. You know? Like for, for schizophrenia patients, for me, it's like, hey, do you ever have thoughts that you're gay? Do you ever have thoughts that you're a slut? Do you ever, mm-hmm. if it's a girl, do you ever have thoughts that you're stupid, that you're mm-hmm. ugly? Um, just because these negative sort of repetitive thoughts go on over and over in yeah. someone with schizophrenia. And with someone with eating disorder, I'm, you know, it might be something more like, hey, what kind of thoughts do you have about food throughout the day? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. What kind of thoughts do you have about your weight throughout the day? Yeah. I guess, yeah, it was just frustrating that no one asked those things because I don't, I'm never going to willingly share them. Yeah, and I think OCD <laughs> is very similar, actually. Yeah. Actually, um, it wasn't until I treated multiple patients with OCD that I knew the right questions to ask mm-hmm. or after I read through the why box multiple times. Yeah. Um, with OCD, it was like, you know, do you, um, do you, sometimes it's like, do you have any odd sexual sort of repetitive thoughts that are distressing to you? Mm-hmm. Now, no one with OCD who has those is going to tell you mm-hmm. unless you ask directly, you know? Yeah. So I think just for people who might not have worked with people with eating disorders, like give me some examples of things if you feel comfortable. Oh, yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah. Um, I would say like if um, if I felt like I ate too much the day before and I had plans to go see someone the next day, I, ha- I would have to cancel because I, I felt like they would noticeably see like a huge difference in weight and that was too embarrassing. Um, like hearing people chew. Um, hmm. Yeah, like, that was that was in particular frustrating, huh? Oh my god, it would drive me nuts. Like, <sighs> and like the sound of people cooking, like dishware, you know, okay. clinging on china or something. And like to this day, so for instance, I always feel horrible about this. Um, I never do anything. I never say anything. So you know, I'm not. I I realize it's me being like neurotic. But for instance. Um, if someone who is morbidly obese or really obese is eating around me and I can hear them eating, even to this day, mm-hmm. it really stresses me out. Like I have to like, so at work there is a person who I have to sit like in close proximity with who is morbidly obese, who eats around me. And that's, they should have the total right to, you know, I shouldn't be, and I, I never do anything, but I have to leave. You, you are it's almost as if you're a little bit frustrated that you do this. But oh, I'm so frustrated with it. myself. But like, I get so panicky because it makes me feel like I'm going to be, I'm going to gain like 50 pounds from this somehow. Like I'm going, I get so worried that that's what's going to happen. So coming back to, um, we just had dinner. Uh-huh. Was there anyone at the restaurant or any way that I was eating? And I, I would be totally okay with you telling me the truth if something bothered you. No. No, no, not this situation. It's specific to, um, and I feel awful saying this, um, people who are really overweight and okay. obese, that bothers me. That's still, does it bother you less than it does? Did it, it probably bothers me less. Least, okay. But um, like at work, I usually have to like get up and leave the office for a little while because I will be, like I'll be sitting there like shaking my leg and sighing and like just cringing and just really stressing out about it um so yeah those are some things and then just being like so paranoid about anything like any medicine that could possibly make me gain weight like even like an antibiotic like literally would google the crap out of anything anyone Mm. ever prescribed me for anything because it was like a drug like this is like a external control over me right and i like that's not okay you know what i mean so that was like another huge thing that i just don't think you would ever think of unless you know or you would expect unless you ask um and then i would say probably like really obsessively exercising at really weird times like getting up at like three in the morning to like go run 10 miles because i had to like burn something off um or probably like there there were times that I missed 
Thanksgiving and Christmas because it was just too stressful because all the food, like if there's too many options, um, that's that was just way too hard. So in once I became an adult, um, you know, not living with my family, I there were several times in college where I didn't see my family on holidays because it was just too stressful. Okay. So coming back to like your story. So you're in college, you have some bad experiences with the dietitian, therapist. Like Mm -hmm. when was it that you first connected with a therapist and you had a good experience? (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, not till this last year. Not to this last year. And out of all ways possible, um, it's through Skype. (laughs) Yeah, I think this is great. (laughs) Yeah, with a psychiatrist I found on the internet, on Instagram. And I saw, like, he does, like, you know, I was like, well, he probably doesn't do it if I'm in the U.S. because he lives in India. And, I mean, I see, like, my doctor here in, in the United States and then I... Have seen my gynecologist, so it's not like I'm totally just doing this all. Can I tell you, I've virtual. actually ref- after you told me about him, I actually referred someone to him. Oh, really? Yeah, that was the first time I connected with a therapist, and I, I, I tried out probably several, um, over the course of a couple of years. And I'd give each one like maybe four or five, six sessions. Like I would really try to stick it out, but I just. I actually felt like it was harder with women than it was with men because I felt like women were always turning it into this body image thing because that's kind of, I think, something that they feel as a woman here in America. And So once again, this is really important and I want to reemphasize this. It's, it's, it's you're feeling a lack of their empathy because they're, they're very much in their own experience. Yeah, yeah. And so this is where, like, I think as clinicians, like, this is this is actually really hard to do to exit out of our own experience yeah. into someone else's to the yeah. extent that like like um like I know my own experience is like I love food like <laughs> you know well, so like yeah that's the thing is I think maybe that's like why like finding this random man you know in a different country who you know has never had an eating disorder and i asked him like do you have any experience with eating disorders and he was straight up he was like not really but Mm -hmm. i I, he i feel like because he doesn't know and doesn't have this experience that he's but he was open oh yeah he was open to listen yeah and he he um he heard what was actually there yeah unlike unlike people with preconceived notions yeah um because I think there's this narrative in our culture that eating disorders because of TV and Instagram and yeah. the movies yeah. and body image. Um, but I think there's this whole other group of people oh, who yeah. have, you know, this sort of genetic oh, yeah. slash. Um, we, we were talking about, you know, there is this sort of mechanism in us. Mm-hmm. in a deep way to be able to survive without food for long periods of time. Yeah. And that stimulates pleasure. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of the theory that sort of you've come to as like makes the most sense for you, you think? Yeah, I really think so. Just like with the whole like feeling you work from it and feeling like, I mean, it was, I mean, I was able to do like, you know, I was succeeding in school incredibly well. I was running like 10 miles a day. Um, I was, you know, until I literally, like, crashed and burned. But um, I would say, for me, I think if we have these genetic markers... So, actually, what's interesting is a lot of the genetic markers, and I included it in that Google Doc, um, that are for schizophrenia, a lot of them match with eating disorders. Like, a lot of them. Um, And so, I don't... I think it can be very genetic it's just a matter of like which mechanism of the bio psychosocial model i think um can flip it on if Mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah i mean there's multiple genes Mm -hmm. for every mental illness you know there's not just one gene yeah yeah that's one thing that most people when they don't understand that how how these things develop it's like no like there's a lot of overlap with mental illness in general Mm -hmm. um but then specifically with you, did you do you have any family members with eating disorders that you know of? Any great grandparents no, that were no, but what's very interesting, slender, died early, or no? Okay. But what? So my father was an alcoholic, and he um, a lot of people that go on to develop bulimia, and this has been studied, 
and I don't, I don't have the name of the study, but I do remember reading this. A lot of them had um, parents with substance abuse disorders um, yeah. as parents. It's specifically bulimia seems to be um, more related to this. Um, so yeah, but my dad, my dad had a lot of issues with mental illness. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes the people who are alcoholics, like they're, they're alcoholics, but underneath the alcohol is like other stuff that they're yes. just like covering oh, yes. with coping. I think, yeah, my father probably fit the bill for that. So I've never had an issue with alcohol, but with the eating stuff. Yes. Okay. And then, um, so there was a one point where you finally felt like you couldn't go on in your sport and academic sort of world. You said you crashed and burned. Do you want to go into that at all? Yeah. I mean, I think at the time, um, so this actually kind of crosses more over into what's called overtraining syndrome, which is like something that's actually kind of hard to do. It's more specific in like sports medicine, but Basically, I was running really hard and like training like a maniac and I wasn't able to sleep because I wasn't eating really um, and I just kept losing weight and that's just so stressful for the body. So the part of that theory that I was talking about earlier with the adapted to flee famine theory and that's seen in, um, my, that was seen in migration patterns of early humans and then also with birds even today. Um, people don't sleep when they're not eating because they're prioritizing finding the food source, um, you know, and there's like a neurobiological driver, you know, giving you that kind of like euphoric feeling. So that definitely happened for me. And then I, I literally couldn't run like nine minute pace for more than like five minutes without feeling like I had to sit down Hmm. and I was sleeping maybe like I couldn't sleep for more than 45 minutes straight. It was, it sounds like almost, honestly, it sounds like some type of like hypomanic episode. Mm -hmm. I've never, it was more really because I was not eating and sleeping and it all went away and it never came back since. Eating? Yeah. And in your, because I know you've been on the eating boards and stuff like that. Yeah. Do a lot of other people have similar issues that you've seen? Yeah. Yeah, um, insomnia is really rampant among people with eating disorders, specifically people who, they don't even necessarily have to be struggling with anorexia or nervosa, but a lot of them, it doesn't matter if you're overweight, but if you're like in this really severe caloric deficiency, um, or you're throwing up your food and not keeping whatever down, um, sleeping is, even people that don't have an eating disorder, but they're just like intensely dieting, that's yeah. pretty common. And um, another thing we touched on was orthorexia. So oh, you, yeah. you, you talked about how often people will shift from anorexia to orthorexia. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I, I've talked to the people at our eating disorder program, and in the future, actually, I'm going to have some people on to talk about this yeah. because it's such a big issue right now. Because they think that they've found the cure, and it's really just the same narrative in a different costume, in my opinion. It's just you're focusing on this singular attribute that is the distractor and I think that is the you're controlling it and I maybe we should define orthorexia for people who haven't heard it um ortho straight to straighten yes um rexia food right so it's like to really order the food that you have so um we were joking around clean eating yeah like whole 30 um like I'm only going to eat uh green plants and um you know vegan but then also like raw you know green juice green juices green juice all day um, every day or you know the i'm gonna be ketogenic i'm gonna be carnivore i'm gonna be so it's basically yeah. taking any of the the popular diets oh, and yeah. it's putting so much energy into that i have a close friend um and she wrote a memoir and she's writing a second edition um and a second book um, and she, she started out anorexic and then started, she became vegan and then raw vegan. And then she, you know, she had, she couldn't eat more than one of this food group and it just made everything worse. And then she ended up just binging on really, you know, hyper palatable foods, um, like processed foods with lots of, you know, salt, sugar, and fat. And 
she started binging and purging and honestly i this is like the you know from one disorder to another but it seems like a very common theme is the anorexia to the orthorexia because it's still like I'm not going to eat this, but I'm going to control it. Did you go into that at all? Or did you have a I sort never of did. phase? Okay, no. No. Um, yeah, but that's that's something we'll dive into more. And it's it's really important as well as clinicians, if, we're, if we know that we're dealing with or, you know, helping someone who has had anorexia, that like pushing them towards like a particular diet can actually yeah. not be a good idea. No, it, it, it kind of in some ways looks like recovery, like... And I mean, I don't know what's true and what's not true with the you know day and age of social media, but there are people who post like what they eat all day. It seems like they're still, I think I shared some of those accounts with you. They still seem very obsessed with food because that's right. all they're sharing. And it's like clean eating mm-hmm. food. And instead of being like, you know, grossly thin, you know, they are now like, they're just focused on being completely shredded. But it's like, Kind of the same thing, in my opinion. If you're so, like, they're just complete, you know, doing bikini body competitions. And, I mean, to an extent, like, I could see how that may be helpful for someone. But it just, I think it can very easily become just kind of the same story, but looking a bit different. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, I think that comes to, like, this sort of topic that we started discussing as well about obsessions with food not really ending. So it's like, how much do we want to think about food during the day? Yeah. And, and we talked about the study. Oh, yeah. Of the, the Minnesota the, starvation study. Yeah. Tell me about that study. <laughs> I love that study. I love it, too. I think it's so unethical. <laughs> no, it, it, they were prisoners. I mean, okay, not that, you know, that makes no, it sound we like should, a jerk, we No, should we should not. I mean, there there's reasons why we don't do, you know, research on prisoners. Because it's yeah. um, this was a few decades cool. ago, though. Okay, so um, go tell me, take so me through the study. So they like these full grown men, and they put them on a diet of like twenty five hundred, I think to twenty seven hundred so calories a day, maintaining their weight for a period of several months, and then they took it way down after that time period to fifteen hundred calories a day, uh, which um, is really low for like a full grown, like adequate size man. Um, that would be like me eating like maybe 900 a day or something like that um because i'm smaller and i'm a woman but so it's like a point of reference there but basically they became totally obsessed with food they would like suck on ice chew sugar-free gum um just like suck on like mints just so they could like get the taste of something and like kind of just send that signal of like you know salivating and like appeasing their stomach um they would like just look up recipes, talk about food all day. They would, they did become somewhat like really um, restless with their like energy, like exercising. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, they lost a ton of weight. And after the study, when when it was over, they binged on food like crazy. Like mm-hmm. some, you know, most of, I think it was like at least half of them binged. Like I'm talking like 10,000 calories a day. Like, they try to record how much they were eating in this after period. Yeah. So this, like, but the the differences between this group of men is, like, there wasn't this, like, you know, underlying psychological component to this, to an extent anyway. And they don't have this guilt about, like, wanting to go back to that behavior. But someone with, someone who's been starving themselves and then binges, if they still have these kind of, like, undertones of this eating disorder, you know, mindset, then that's when... Th- purging kind of enters but the yeah these guys became totally obsessed with food right and, and it didn't stop until they that's like our weight that's like our culture I know, that's it like yeah. it's like um you know like how much do we think about food we think about food so much I know. in our culture like as a whole like i've read probably about 20 books on food really yeah yeah, see, like that, and I'm I'm a I'm a guy. Well, you're a doctor. I'm a doctor, and a lot of those were like trying to figure out, you know, what the healthy diets were, and the, but honestly, still, like, there it's, is no it's, one diet that's healthy. I just think there's never going to be a specific answer. But I think people want, like, especially people with an eating disorder, want like this c- continuation of like boom, 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 like 
have all my ducks in a row. Like I'm only going to eat this now. It's it's kind of like your um, the dietitian who said I'll only talk about food. Yeah. I won't talk about emotions. Yeah. And emotions are a lot more difficult to talk about oh, than yeah. food. Yeah. Um, food it it can be very sort of um, you know soothing to think about food, especially if you're starving. Soothing as um, my, the analyst uh, who mentors me would talk about food and eating as like an oral hunger. And it relates back to like when we were very young and, Mm -hmm. you know, breastfeeding. And Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we want to be fed. We want, you know, so eating and eating together, I think it's really important. It's Mm -hmm. an important way to like connect. But yeah, so, so it comes back to like this question of like, okay, how do we think less about food? I think that's different for someone who's been dieting a long time and had an eating disorder. How do you, how do you, how have you been able to think less about food? Oh yeah. Yeah. How were you able to do that? Well, truthfully, honestly, I mean, I just, (laughs) I gained like 20 pounds and that was, that was a lot of it. But for someone like you, you know, I'm assuming you've never had an eating disorder. I could be wrong, but I'm assuming that's a no. But you've read like 20 books on food. I mean, I feel like your reason is a bit more, you know, scientific than like the average Joe out there just like going nuts about food and being a foodie or whatever. But like, I think the answer looks different for someone who's had an eating disorder, you know. Yeah. So I think you were, it's like that, um, the study, the Minnesota study that we were talking about, Mm -hmm. like when they were underweight, Mm -hmm. they thought about food all the time. Yeah. They read cookbooks for fun. Yeah. They talked about food. Yeah. And then once they got back to their normal weight, all of a sudden... They were fine. They weren't thinking about food all the time. Yeah, I mean, so for instance, even at my lowest weight, I think I technically never met the BMI standard for like underweight, but I looked really bad. Um, So I think... And at your lowest weight, you thought about food. Oh, yeah, because it was an unattainable weight that I got to through, like, horrible methods. You know what I mean? It's not like I had always been that way, and that's just, you know, who I was and just was a slim person, right? But, yeah, I thought about food all the time. Like, I would go to the grocery store for, like, hours, just hours, and, like, look at food. I would um, watch, you know, like, (laughs) I think I put, like, a link in that Google Doc. Um, It's, like, deeply buried in there. Like, have you ever heard of a mukbang? Mm. Oh, my God. Like, Good. I don't even know how to explain it. Basically, someone buys like a ton of food. I'm talking like whole big family Thanksgiving amount of food, right? Like a ton of food. And they put it all out and they just, they talk about a story totally unrelated to the food. They just start talking about their life. And it's like a 30, 40 minute video of them binging on food. And that's the thing on YouTube. There's so, like, thousands millions of hits that's insane like that's so nuts to me that as a society but people with eating disorders are obsessed with those and i would watch them oh because you get some type of like vicarious like you know need met like watching someone else eat so like i sent you that video of that girl and yeah she's like yeah. salivating like she's watching someone else eat and she's, she's pleasuring in it eat and, and, she's and, like, and, and 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 i think that's because of mere neurons because oh, yeah. when we watch someone do something like our brain lights up in the same way yeah so if you're craving something yeah then we want to watch other people doing that act that we crave yeah. you know yeah um, but i guess regardless you have an eating disorder or not like if you we live in a society where certain foods are demonized and this, this diet is perfect but whenever any of us kind of adopts that ideology i think that kind of comes into play like oh i can't eat that but like i mean i'm obsessed about it now you know i um so i used to wrestle in high school and i had to drop like my from football to wrestling like 30 mm-hmm. pounds and i did it in like over a couple you know a month basically oh my god um, I, I had wrestlers in, in and, college and too. so i was I, and and just talking about this with you brings me back to those days after weigh in when we would go to oh breakfast. God. I've and like, seen the wrestlers just binge out. We would on like food. Like everyone would just be like like pre planned what they want. I know. Like people would like write it out. Like yeah. as people waited to get their food, <laughs> they would be <laughs> drinking the creamers. <laughs> like all the creamers in the restaurant would be gone. Um, all this sort of you know, but and one of my friends who was like, he could never make the weight that he needed to, like, but he would think about that one meal that he got. And he, that's all he could think about. 
I know. I, I, you know? I totally get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would sit and plane out my food for hours, like for the week, like hours, you know, like I said, I go to the grocery store for hours. I would do that. And I don't do any of those things anymore. Like none of them. I mean, it took a really long time for that to happen, but. Okay. So tell me the practical things that allowed you to do that. Like in your journey, like the, you talked about the one good therapist that you've had yeah. in the last year. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other, like, what are the things that have been most helpful? for that recovery. Cause I'm, I'm sure someone's going to listen to this. Who's like not in recovery yet. Like what advice would you give that person? Do you think those kind of people listen to this? Oh, for sure. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. hundred percent. Oh, okay. I just thought it was a bunch of people like sitting there with their DSM, like <laughs> their glasses on, like I'm going to learn something today. I thought I was the only one that wasn't really like, Oh no. I'd, <laughs> okay. I'd probably say about, um, about half Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. That's I would estimate awesome. about a half yeah. are not mental health professionals, but they're like, yeah, the, the seriously curious and, and they're often intellectual intellectuals who are curious, who, um, read a lot, who yeah. learn a lot. Like they're learners, okay, you yeah. know, there you um, go. I just complimented my audience, which is, <laughs> which I believe, well, I believe you those things section to be true. On your page. And when I joined, like I wanted to see your resources, it says like, like all the different jobs you could have as a, and that's yeah. and then it's like I'm just interested yeah. like exclamation point. So, so the most of the people who sign up for my resources um are people who are mental health professionals cuz I yeah. think a lot of those are like higher end yeah. you know oh yeah like practitioner levels mm-hmm. type content. Um but yeah, I would say probably about half, especially like some of the episodes like on Ted Bundy and you know stuff like that. I mean Yeah. That's, yeah, I could see. That's I been a little that. bit more popular in the the general culture yeah so um but yeah the things that i think enabled me to like get from like you know just obsessing about food all day to not like i said probably um actually finding a therapist that i liked but at that point i wasn't actually obsessed with food when i started working with him i would say the gaining weight part and then just letting myself eat whatever i wanted like did you stop giving food this like you know, majestic, you know, ruling that it was like sacred or something like that. Did you, um, did you like learn about stuff online that was helpful? Was it like, or just, was it like life events that was, um, no, honestly, no, I just, it happened. I remember like I stopped, I, I think the first, so I went on Zoloft like a year and a half ago and I remember, like, within two weeks, like, I, I stopped obsessing about food as much. And I, like, stopped purging from, like, ten, let's say it was probably averaging, like, ten purges a week. I got it down to, like, twice a week within, like, a month. And so, and then I, after that point, I think it, I just stopped obsessing about food. And I stopped binging. And then I stopped purging. And that, you know, happened less and less. Um, I didn't gain weight, actually lost weight going on Zoloft, but, um, whenever I stopped trying to like control my weight, if that makes sense. I don't know if that. Yeah. And so Zoloft, sertraline, you know, SSRI, so serotonin yeah. reuptake inhibitor. So it's, it's causing, um, you know, it will decrease obsessionality. So it's like con- the impulse. It decreases the, um, the obs- sometimes we give it for people with OCD. It decreases yeah. the obsessionality. It decreases, mm-hmm. I don't know, did it help depression or anxiety for you as well? No, it really didn't help my depression at all. Um, but it really helped with the purging specifically. Um, but I, I, I think that was like, honestly, I had already gained, so I gained quite a bit of weight um, with binging and purging over the years of college. And so whenever I started to try to stop the purging um, and just let myself eat what I wanted, you know, food kind of lost its, like, sex appeal, if that makes sense. And then whenever the purging and binging stopped and my, you know, weight kind of just settled out, um, I think that, like, I wish I wish I could tell you some, like, really great, like, therapeutic techniques but for me it was just very biological um 
And I think, though, if I had to pinpoint, like, one type of, like, more aspect targeted towards, like, psychotherapy would be, like, um, so working with the therapist that I've started working with in this last year. Um, so something I would have said to a previous therapist, and this is kind of, like, circling back to this lack of empathy thing, like, he was like, well, let's say you woke up tomorrow and you were 10 pounds heavier what would you do? And I literally said, and this was a few months ago, I was like, I couldn't leave my house. There's no way I could leave my house. And he, he didn't like, be like, well, that's stupid. You know, he was like, okay, that's, that's really fair. You know, like why? Like, you know, he wasn't, he didn't brush it off. Like, that's just like so dumb. Like who cares? You know, but but that's so dumb. Who cares? Yeah. You felt that from other people, but you didn't feel it from. No, because he didn't respond with like, some crazy look like yeah yeah yeah. you know just move on with your life right um right so move move on with your life doesn't work like it's like i felt like they were making it sound like i was you know previous clinicians like i was shallow Mm -hmm. you know that i was like just obsessed with my appearance and i just wanted to look good and it's really about like i think in working with my therapist in last year kind of just analyzing why i've you know over the years um, you know, culminated this, you know, zoning in on my weight and food, giving me a sense of worthiness and of kind of analyzing why I was giving so much of, you know, depth and power to my weight and what I was eating and why does that make me a more worthy or less worthy person? Yeah. Um, so instead of my therapist just kind of being like, well, that's silly. You're, you know, such such a beautiful girl. You've got a lot going for you. Um, you know, this therapist, he was the first one to really, when I would say the, these thoughts that I thought just sounded stupid, like, you know, I can't leave my house tomorrow if I wake up heavier. Like, that, I feel like that sounds so stupid, right? He would be like, yeah, that would be really tough. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I don't... So he was really the first one that I, like you said, kind of like mirroring. Well, it would be them. really tough to, to have that intensity of a thought that yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to leave my house. Yeah, I'd be like, I'd have to call off work. Like, I couldn't deal with it, you know? Yeah. About missing, like, you know, I've missed my family, you know, dinners, my family, you know, holiday get togethers, like, missing, um, like, just so many things I, I missed out on because of this just total anxiety about what I was going to eat and how it was going to affect my body the next day. Um, and I guess just kind of like reanalyzing like why, why, why do I, you know, that's not stupid. That doesn't make me shallow. Like, it, you know, there's a real reason for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, um, and then I think that negative sort of self-talk Mm. you know that would go on with those earlier therapists you were Mm -hmm. starting to mention that a little bit how like with earlier therapists you would have this negative self-talk these these sort of things but you wouldn't express them yeah i like how i would think i was like just this shallow right white privileged girl who just needs to get it together because like this obviously sounds stupid and i you know i just i'm way too obsessed with my image um, you know, I, that's what I, even though deep down, that's not what I was feeling, but I was like, well, maybe that's just, maybe that's what it is because that's kind of the message and the vibe that I was receiving mm-hmm. from their, um, you know, lack of curiosity when I said these things. Yeah. And I think, I think that leads to kind of the importance of talking and as, as a therapist, mm-hmm about what is going on in the here and now mm-hmm. with people. Okay. You know, so like, for example, these, these therapists, they might have noticed like, huh, she is kind of reacting odd or, you know, mm-hmm. with withdrawing a little bit mm-hmm. or seems to ex- be experiencing shame or guilt mm-hmm. after we're talking about this. I wonder what's going on, you know? Do you see what I'm talking about, the interpersonal? Yeah. It's like, it's like what's going on in your head right now yeah like so our cameras went out for a second and you started sharing like what was going on in your head right now (laughs) and i think that's important to talk about i'd like to talk about that actually about 
you know yeah what is this experience like talking about oh like like you're eating oh i feel like i just am like talking too much like i feel like i'm just like blabbering on and just you know like i'm i'm worried i'm just sharing like a lot of useless information and i'm you know not getting to the point quickly enough and i'm you know going off on all these insignificant uh tangents yeah to which and talking too much about myself too i i i really don't want this to be like you know about me because it i just feel like that is awful yeah well i mean okay so it's hard to think that there might be someone critical on the other side of this right listening watching um and i would say from my experience i think a lot of people are going to find this really helpful i've been getting a lot of messages um DMs from people asking for, you know, eating disorder content, teaching about eating disorder. And so I was excited to have you come out and share your journey because very rarely, you know, it takes courage to share your journey. It takes courage to put yourself out there. And, um, and also I think it's really important that the person is at a certain level of recovery, Mm -hmm. you know, like you have you've been through therapy for years you've had Mm -hmm. you've had success Mm -hmm. you know in your journey and i think that's really important because that's hopeful Mm -hmm. um because you know as we treat people with mental health issues sometimes we only see them at their worst the worst like the first two years of residency for me like is was mostly impatient and so people were suicidal or psychotic Mm -hmm. and you never saw them two months later when they're outpatient yeah. Um, you never see the fall through the resolution. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, that's why it's like really exciting to get this sort of longitudinal story out there of like, Hey, this is my journey. Yeah. Um, this is how I stopped thinking about food all the time. Yeah. And tonight we went out, had a hamburger together with, with my video guy, Jonathan. <laughs> and, uh, we had a great time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. So, uh, any other thoughts on like the, the here and now or what's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't categorize myself, like, you know, super severe end of the spectrum. Um, I've never required, like, some intensive, like, inpatient, like, hospitalization. At one point, you know, maybe that would have been considerably, like, the next step, some type of, like, partial day treatment or something. But, you know, there are people who are, have, like, you know, and not not that my suffering is any less because there are people who have it worse or more severe, but like my experience is just mine, and it's um, I think that you can still draw a lot of lessons from it. But every person with an eating disorder is gonna have completely, you know, can have. Obviously, there can be some common themes, but mm-hmm. have a completely different like projection. Right. Totally. You right. know, and you have to like dig into that because it's not it's just not ever going to be like this one size fits all like oh this is it's because of blah 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 right no i think that's really helpful to put out there we were talking over dinner how in my in the system the mental health system that Mm -hmm. i work in we have a really good day treatment program Mm -hmm. and it and it's i would say you know when you were in college, like you would have totally fit into that group. Yeah. And that yeah. probably would have been really helpful for you. Oh yeah. But you figured out a lot of those things on your own mm-hmm. and, you, and, and maybe, um, you know, you didn't have those resources available, which is, which is too bad. Um, but there's day treatment programs mm-hmm. and then, you know, there are, um, inpatient places. So we've mm-hmm. had some patients that like, for whatever reason, we could not get them, to gain any weight in mm. a day treatment program. And so they needed to yeah. be at more of like a, um, a place where they stay for a month, yeah. 60 days. Um, and those can be really expensive and the insurances don't yeah. always pay. I know two of my friends have gone through that and it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then there's therapists that are experienced, um, in eating disorders yeah. and honestly, a good therapist can do a lot of good and maybe just meeting twice a week, you know, outpatient. Yeah. So there's a certain level of acuity where that would be, um, yeah. I mean, I found a lot of progress. Um, so I just kind of looked outside 
the resources that I had within my community and like the um you know what was warranted with like through insurance so I just chose to do out-of-pocket pay for obviously the psychiatrist that I see um but with that like I said I have like un- I could message him right now if I wanted to yeah. um you know and then with my primary care doctor um same thing it's like unlimited access and so actually there was a point when so my so this is like the day and age of technology and I think you'd have to be pretty like kind of like far into the end of like remission or like be like really open to like and wanting to get better but like so my scale that I've had it connects to wi-fi and so it uploads in my medical chart and so like my so that like my doctor can see it like daily Hmm. you know what I mean oh wow so like like looking at resources where I just had more contact with my doctors because I, I really needed more accountability than like just going to the doctor like once every three months like that wasn't enough accountability for me. that's not yeah and i think um i think that could go kind of terribly for some people with an eating disorder <laughs> so like i said you can, i think you have to really like be kind of really invested into it and really honest but and that that brings up an important topic that like you got to a place where you're like i want to get better yeah and it a lot of people with eating disorders especially anorexia don't it's usually not the case but with bulimia i mean purging is so painful it's not fun it's so painful most people with bulimia, i mean i was literally desperate to stop and that's that was so desperate like i i refused Zoloft for like a year and then i was like oh my god like anything to stop this you know yeah and th- and then once you got on it it seems like it's been like all this anti-psychiatry stuff in the media because i know you're yeah, You're they really yeah they like made it seem stuff. like it was gonna like you know I literally had to have my doctor talk to me like over and over again because I had read all these horrifying articles about how it's like gonna eat my brain and give me Alzheimer's and uh, I I am gonna gain weight on it and I'll be hooked for life I mean that's like what these you know and it's that's not been my experience at all like at all. And I, it's like, I, if I feel like if I hadn't, if those kind of, you know, really like harmful, you know, not truthful, you know, pieces of information were out there, I feel like I would have gone on Zoloft a lot sooner. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's tough. That's tough. I, um, yeah. I get, I'm getting more of that stuff lately as I get more out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I didn't really know a lot of that stuff existed, honestly. Yeah. Um, other than, you know, certain um, religious organizations that are very anti-psychiatry that I don't even want to name out loud. I dug deep into that this yeah? past weekend. Okay. Yeah, but apparently leaving them alone in a room, um, because this is, what, I guess, what they did, still unnamed, uh, in a straight jacket until, you know, God did its work is more ethical than going to the hospital. Right. They, uh, and it, when it's... Um, when it's someone with a personality disorder, they can probably shame them into compliance. But when it's someone with true mania, you know, that person um, ended up dying. Yeah. So. I um, mean, I've like, because I work in the ER, like I've seen some people really, really struggling. I mean, like they're trying to fight demons. The room's on fire. They are God. And I mean, I never thought that's, st- I thought that was like, you know, but I can think of like at least five people in the last few months that, you know, and I don't see the full of it. I just see like bits and pieces Yeah. in my position. I don't see, you know, much of it, but like, just, I mean, it's like what I just really, the anti-psychiatry stuff, but it's, it really feeds into the fear of people with an eating disorder mm-hmm. because you know what I mean? I feel like it's, it's like, this is going to make you worse. This is definitely because it's a lot of the articles I've read talk about how all of all of these drugs are like obesogenics and everybody and people gain weight for so many different reasons and i know some drugs can be you know more specific to that but with zoloft i mean i even after reading i read like you know pubmed articles and there was no change in weight like no significant finding right and then i would but i would still go read these like shared experiences of people like these organizational yeah. websites mm-hmm. 
And I was like, that over that was completely able to override yeah. any hard science that I had read because I was, you know, that's really frustrating. I know. Yeah. Okay. Well, good, good things have happened and that's good. We gotta, we should probably bring this. Yeah. I, yeah. We should probably <laughs> bring this to a, a close. Um, it was really good to have you out and, um, I'm sure this is going to help a lot of people just hearing this and, and that's why we do this. Um, and, as always, I will allow you to listen to it and tell me if you want to cut out any portion. No, I always I always give the person the final say. Um, so, yeah. Do you want to um, have me put your link in the show notes or in my Instagram when I post this? Oh, to the Google Doc? Or, or to the... So, number or one... to tag me or We're something. going to have a nice document that you've created that we'll put up on the website okay. for people to... You don't have to do that. To I, th- I think it's really good. So oh, okay. it's super interesting. You did a deep dive. We, a lot of things that we didn't even get to talking about like different things that people are saying uh, in, you know, these groups about yeah. their experience and about yeah. providers and bad experiences yeah. and um, different things like that. So we'll put that out there. The link should be in the show notes. And um, when I post on Instagram, I'll link to your account as well. So people can get to know you or ask you questions. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I still can't believe this is happened. <laughs> this is happened. <laughs> I've like incessantly DM'd you for, like for my, not, you know, just for, I want your opinion on this. This is, this is the truth that I actually respond to DMs. I'm a real person. <laughs>